Okay, welcome to the first lecture of the Operating Systems course, Principles of Operating Systems. And what I'm going to do today is go over Chapter 1 of the text, which is an introduction um, to the overall concept. I'm actually going to cover a lot of things. In fact, I'm going to cover the entire book today. But it's going to be a brief overview. And then next week, we'll cover Chapter 2, which will be part of today, and 3 and 4 and 5. And we'll kind of go through like sort of a sequence. Uh, but today what I want to do is cover the concept of what it is we're doing here in terms of what operating systems do. Uh, the computer system organization, some of the architectural stuff, some of the structures, operations, processes. And if you've looked at the syllabus, you'll see that we have like an entire lecture on processes, threads, memory management, storage management, security, and all these different subtopics. So today's really just a you know complete overview of the entire course with a lot more detail. Um, so it's a grand tour of the major operating systems concepts and components. And so uh, just getting into the, you know, the first topic of interest might be what an operating system is. Um, in theory, a lot of people think operating systems are just on computers, you know, like personal computers, notebook computers. Um, it's, it's kind of interesting now that we have tablets out. Some people are becoming aware, oh, we have Android. Well, that's an operating system. We have my Windows, Microsoft Windows. We have the Mac OS X. We have those are actually really just a category of operating systems, and they fall into the personal computing or desktop computing categories. And we have other different types of operating systems. As an example, a network operating system like Novell uh, that's used to connect a lot of computers together. The Sun uh, operating system. Uh, we have operating systems on microwave ovens, on refrigerators, on watches, on cell phones, on any really any device that is hardware that communicates with a user and has a user interface usually to it, but it doesn't have to have a user interface, and is considered an operating system. In fact, even a vacuum cleaner that's not even, let's say, not even like electronic, let's say it's a manual, it really is an operating system if you think about it. Because there's a way of uh, all the components fitting together, and there's some seamless integration of a bunch of parts and pieces that makes it into an operating system. So the term is actually kind of broad. This course, we're going to focus on features of computer operating systems, desktop operating systems. But they all do the same thing, and they all fall under the same definition. And the definition, if you want to look at the first bullet point, a program that acts as an intermediary between the user and computer hardware or computers. Uh, nowadays everything is computerized. Uh, so we always think of, you know, the computer as an operating system, but it doesn't actually have to be. It's just hardware to human interface. The goal is to execute programs, solve problems, provide a means to operate the hardware. So on a microwave oven, the operating system it lights up a illuminates a panel that press in numbers and has a little L C D screen. And it has like IO, it has input output because you're inputting you know, I want to cook something for five minutes, or, you know, and this is, you know, I'm going to put popcorn in there or something like that, press popcorn buttons and stuff. Um, and so you're pressing something, you're giving input, you're getting output, the thing is doing something, which basically meets the requirements of an operating system. Um, so we also make uh, the computer itself, the system, more convenient for users. We relate it back to, um, like, tablets and things of that nature. And we use the uh, computer hardware in an efficient manner. Because uh, the interesting thing is it's kind of, um, the concept of the operating system came about sort of like the glue. So on a computer system, um, we have to, you know, we have a processor on there. We have memory on there. We have a hard drive normally. We have I.O. ports and a bunch of electronics that gives us this abstraction of the computer system. And in the old days when we had uh, the disk operating system, DOS, it wasn't very useful because the operating system itself wasn't providing us very much outside of a command prompt and then the user had to remember the names of programs, had to remember commands and things to do and there was a lot of low-level type of program. People used to write their own programs in basic and stuff to go access the hard drive, to go format files and things and uh, as time has progressed we've really grown actually in terms of the uh, abstraction and now the operating system is more along the lines of the, the way we're going to control everything without actually having to remember. So the user doesn't normally even have to remember anything today. You just look at an icon on a desktop and double click it kind of thing. Um, 
And that, that's basically a form of a user interface. So that's where the user interface sort of concept came out of. So the UI or the HCI, human computer interface, is nothing more than the tools that were created by the operating system to make the hardware more usable, or pliable. So we have the computer system structure to consider. And the computer system structure is divided into four different components. The hardware, or the underlying resource, uh, which is going to give us our CPU, our memory, our I.O. devices. And uh, if you're uh, brand new to computer science, normally the recommendation is to take a hardware course and then take an operating systems course and then take programming language concepts and uh, courses in terms of application development because then you get all three components of it. Um, but in terms of the hardware, we're not going to cover very much hardware in this course. I'll save that for a computer architecture course. Uh, but we are going to cover the operating system. And the operating system it controls and coordinates the use of the hardware and the various different applications and users that's available. And then this concept of application programs, which is why you take programming courses, so you can learn how to write application programs that write on top of the operating system. So it defines the different ways that the system resources are being used by the programs. So word processors, compilers, web browsers, things of that nature, video games, those are actually all application programs. Everybody judges operating systems by the application programs <laughs> and by the user interface and the desktop controls. Even all of the new um, tablet interfaces. The entire interface is like representing the entire utility of the device. So that's basically how it's being judged. So it's kind of like judging a book by its cover in some ways though, because some hardware is better than other hardware. Some devices perform faster. But the user never, the casual user who doesn't study operating systems never really even thinks about that. They just go, well, what is it? Windows? <laughs> Android? Um, so, users, machines, other computers, those are all parts of the operating system structure as well. And here's our four components put on into a, to, into a chart <coughs> where we have this layered hierarchy to kind of consider the hardware is underneath the operating systems on top of the hardware. The systems and the application programs are on top of the operating system. So this is um, sort of like, uh, you know, if you think about the concept of Java and JVM in the virtual machine environment, they uh, create an environment in which they can have cross-platform compatibility and treat all platform, all hardware systems the same by loading something on top of the operating system, which is going to be another operating system. So even the JVM, the Java Virtual Machine, is an operating system by definition. It's loading on top of the operating system and it's providing its own operating system for its own format, for its own fi files, the class files that are being run. But without a JVM and you're just running on top of the operating system, you're dealing with the Windows interface or the Mac OS X interface or something else, uh, Android or something of that nature. And so we have compilers, assemblers, text editors, databases, all sorts of different programs that are being operated by users. So the interface is actually quite simple if you break it down into those four components and you consider how the layers of the interface sort of work together. Um, so by definition, the operating system is a resource allocator, manages all of the resources of the computer, decides between conflicting requests uh, for efficient and fair use of the re resources. Because if we go back up to here and take a look, we have simultaneous users logging on to the same hardware, using the same resources. The operating systems is really what is in control of uh, who's going to access what and when and the timing. And it's kind of interesting because when we start looking at the, the first, one of the first technical concepts we'll look at is the concept of CPU scheduling. Uh, because down here in the hardware we have a CPU, everyone's familiar with that normally from a hardware course, central processing unit, which is really the brains of the operation, the most expensive part of the computer these days as well, <laughs> but uh, those chips are pretty pricey compared to all the other components. Uh, but in theory, uh, we're still looking at, on a single CPU type system, we're still looking at single threads of operation, command in sequences like batch jobs, you know, one right after the other. We don't really have multi processing from a hardware perspective. We're still relying upon the operating system to give us that abstraction. So when all these users are clicking on stuff, writing files, doing all sorts of different things, all this stuff is getting scheduled by the operating system. A CPU scheduler is taking all this activity 
and then allowing the hardware, because the hardware only works on one instruction at a time, it allows the hardware to essentially, you know, here's an instruction, here's an instruction, and so the hardware kind of works constantly, hopefully, to uh, run all the jobs that are being sent to it from all these different users, and there's a priority on the jobs, and there's scheduling for the different uh, resources that are going to be used. And that's one of the things we'll be talking about kind of soon, actually, in the next couple weeks, is the concept of the CPU scheduler and what's that accomplishing. On the outside of the resource allocation, the operating system is also in control. Um, it's the control program, so it controls execution of the programs to prevent errors and improper use of the computer. So when you run Microsoft Word or PowerPoint or something, the operating system is actually in control of the execution of that program. It's, let, it's, it's allocating resources to the program, it's letting the program access certain things. So it can provide a level of protection as well, which is what you get with the JVM. Going back to that as an operating system concept. The JVM, uh, it has security, uh, network facility, network uh, features, all sorts of different components in there to make sure that the user is not going to run something, a program that's going to harm the underlying operating system. No universally accepted definition of an operating system, which is kind of interesting. I think it's because we have different ways of describing different types of operating systems, and there's many different types. So you really can't come out with a generic description of what an operating system is supposed to do. So everything a vendor ships when you order an operating system is a good approximation, uh, but varies widely. So some operating systems have tools, techniques, uh, programs, and things. As an example, Microsoft Windows, for example. Um, Includes a text editor, notepad, includes a calculator, includes paint, actually, includes a bunch of utilities. That in the old days, before uh, we had Windows, actually, we didn't really have all of those tools and things that were shipped with the operating system. So you can't say that DOS as an operating system is the same as Windows. You can't say that that really is the same as Android. In fact, anything, the Android operating systems that you see on tablets have everything. <laughs> they have email clients. They have web browsers, they have all sorts of different tools and things that are built into it. So coming up with a universal definition is really impossible, actually. Because you're not you're not comparing apples with apples. You got different or IBMs with IBMs. <laughs> you got different different platforms. It makes a really significant huge difference. There is one thing that's in common though, among all of these different operating systems, is this concept of there being multiple layers. Uh, and the layers are more of an abstraction. So we have one program that runs all the time on most of these systems, like 99.9%. .9%. And the program that runs all the time is usually referred to as the kernel. So we all know about apples, fruit, <laughs> or uh, avocados, or pears, or peaches. Or, you know, they all have these, this core kernel in the middle of it, which is kind of like the way that's defined for an operating system. The kernel is there, we can't get rid of it, unless we spit it out for eating fruit, but <laughs> it's always on our computer, and it's the underlying program that's always running, that's essentially going to control everything else that's around it. So, even Windows has a kernel, it's usually the command interpreter, command.com. Uh, Linux has a kernel, it's actually, they call it a kernel. Uh, Android's got a kernel. Uh, everybody's got a kernel. So that's one thing that all these operating systems do have in common. And I'm going to spend probably next week, I think, I can't remember what, when it comes up in the schedule, but there's an entire lecture on kernels and what the kernel is responsible for and what it does. Everything else in the program is part of an application program. So usually everything outside of the kernel is an application. It's not an operating system. So computer startup. This is kind of uh, the basic bootstrap program. So when you turn a computer on, it powers up some circuits, allows electricity to flow through, right? Sends up uh, some signal to the BIOS, and the BIOS turns on and gets powered up. And uh, typically stored in the ROM or the EEPROM, known as the firmware. You can call it a BIOS, you can call it a firmware. It's the hard, it's the information that's stored actually on the hardware that's going to initialize the kernel. So it initializes all aspects of the system. What it, The first thing it does is it loads that kernel and starts the execution. And then the kernel is responsible for loading everything else. If you've ever uh, had a, an iP 
iPhone, actually an iPod does this, and so does, uh, so does the iPhone, actually. You can see the boot sequence. If you've ever accidentally destroyed just destroy your iPod or something, <laughs> sometimes when you boot it up, you get a black screen, and it says, oh, kernel failed, or no, no kernel, or it says some weird message, because the hardware still works, but you messed up the software on it, so it's not going to load the kernel correctly. And the kernel is not normally stored on the firmware. It is usually stored on some secondary storage. So it kind of gets into the concept of memory as well. Secondary storage is anything that's not stored on the hardware. But we can have secondary storage that is physically stored, such as this, the new solid-state solid drives and uh, flash and all sorts of different new types of media. And they're really not new anymore. can actually be physically located on the board but it's actually still called secondary memory. Primary memory or main memory is what the CPU uses. Secondary memory is what the user uses normally. Um, and the boot sequence normally uses like the first part, one little section of the secondary memory because it needs to store the kernel somewhere. Your operating system is usually stored on your secondary memory as well. And it gives you more flexibility in terms of the configuration. In the old days, they actually put, used to put it all on the board. And then they went, oh, it's too big. So then, you know, it got separated out. So here's our computer system organization. And uh, it's kind of a, this is not a replacement for a hardware course. <laughs> this is kind of, a, kind of abstract. We have one or more CPUs. And uh, where's our CPUs in here? There are CPUs. Uh, that are, uh, we have device controllers that connect everything together. We have shared memory. We have concurrent execution of CPUs for different devices. So we usually have things called buses that hold everything together, more like a, you know, wiring, if you want to think of it that way. We have controllers, we have devices, we have uh, graphics adapters, USB controllers, IDE, SCSI. And then we have memory that's associated with it. This would be the main memory. And then on here, like the disk here, this would be like the secondary memory. And so the abstraction actually is kind of interesting. And I'll talk about a lot more about this when we talk about memory. But um, usually anything stored closer to the CPU and abstraction is faster. So uh, cache memory, main memory, always faster. Because it's, it's, if you think about the concept, you know, it's like we have to go through here, we have to go here, up to here, up to here. The farther away we have to travel down the buses, the slower the access and the use of the memory is. So we have a lot of different types of memory. We have registers, we have cache memory, we have main memory, logical, virtual, um, kind of different abstractions of that memory. And it's all organized to do absolutely nothing more than make the computer run faster. <laughs> make the CPU, utilize the CPU as, as much as possible um, to make the system run faster. And that kind of brings up another interesting point. A lot of people judge the operating system on different characteristics. Usually speed and its capabilities are two main factors in terms of how you're going to judge one operating system over another. In terms of the consistent, this computer system organization, I.O. devices, CPU can uh, execute concurrently, meaning that something over here can execute while something over here is executing and over here is executing. But the CPU can only work with one at a time which is why we, now modern systems have dual CPUs on them, so it increases the processing power, uh, which is, I'm surprised it didn't happen like years ago, but the technology just wasn't there. So Each device controller is in charge of a particular device type. The kernel keeps track of all of the devices that are on the system, so we have a bunch of tables that are stored inside of the kernel memory that keeps track of all of the different device states when it's running, when it's not running. And we usually have what's called device queues that are established. And these are data structures that are keeping track of all of the future requests that come into the system. Sort of like a, the kernel is sort of like a traffic cop. You know, it stands there and says, okay, you guys can go. All right, you guys can go. And it's orchestrating the entire use of the hardware. Um, it's keeping track of what the CPU is doing, what the I.O. devices are doing. It's getting error messages from the uh, I.O. devices, usually in the form of interrupts that are coming. And then it's sending messages to the user um, to say, hey, you know what, CD-ROM drive's broken, or CD-ROM drive's door is open now. 
as feedback from a request to open it. And it's basically kind of just being the traffic cop, if you think about it. Um, CPU moves uh, data to and from memory, to and from local buffers, I.O. Uh, from the device to a local buffer of the controller. Device controllers inform the CPU that's finished, usually, with an interrupt. So interrupts, uh, interrupts transfer control from the uh, interrupt service routine, generally. Um, and uh, what we're looking at is kind of a, you know, I usually draw this on the board, but I don't see a pen here. I usually can kind of imagine a box here. Maybe I can do it on the computer, actually. Uh, yeah, no, let's do it. Let me, let me try it real quick here. Let's see if this is going to be successful or not. It's left on slide 12. Uh, let's bring up Text Wrangler. Uh, here we go. This is a new experiment here. User mode. <laughs> Kernel mode. All I want to do is put a line here. Um, how did we get here? I don't know. There we go. And then uh, over here, uh, we have interrupts. Oops, no, let me go down here. Do this for a second. I'm going to make this bigger in a few minutes as soon as I draw it out. <laughs> you could draw this on your paper. Uh, it's actually kind of an important concept to keep in mind. Maybe I should save this one all done too. Uh, let's see. This is going to be hardware. Okay, so let me make this bigger so you can kind of see what I'm looking at. Well, that actually kind of worked, I think. So make it a little bigger. Well, that looks pretty good. <laughs> okay, I'm impressed <laughs> with myself. Um, okay, so from a hardware down here in the hardware perspective, hardware sends interrupts. I'll put this in. Interrupts. Upward. Can't put an arrow going upward. But hardware sends interrupts to the kernel. The user sends what's called system calls downward to the kernel. The kernel can also uh, send signals. Let's see if I can get. It. I don't know how to do it. Let's see signals. They go upward. So think of these as uh, you're in a user mode and you're, you have a program, and you want to open up a CD-ROM drive. You'd send a system call downward, and uh, I don't have a down arrow on my computer, otherwise I'd try to type that in, but you'd go down this way <laughs> to, to send the kernel a, uh, an instruction that says, open a CD-ROM drive. Okay, so CD-ROM drive uh, is part of what's going to be a, it's going to be in the device table. It's going to have a number located to it. And it's going to be, it's going to have a driver, and the driver gets loaded in the kernel mode, or gets, it's either inside of the kernel, or it's outside of the kernel. So we have drivers, we have memory managers, we have all sorts of queues, uh, IO, IO queues, queues, whatever, something like that running out of room on that side, so I'll go like this with it. These are all things that are inside of this kernel mode. Uh, not to mention CPU scheduler. CPU scheduler. And uh, these are all tools that the kernel needs. So if it, gets a, if it uh, receives a system call request, and a system call by terminology is just a request from user mode to have the kernel do something. So a system call, let me just go back to here a little bit are usually implemented in what's called an API, Application Programming Interface. And an example of one, for example, would be read. Or write, depending upon the device. And, uh, what do we do here? Here we go. Here we go. Get, well, okay. There we go. Read, write, open, close. 
I could go on for a few more, but yeah, I think you get the point. And there are low-level instructions that are encapsulated in a higher-level application programming interface that would request something using a system call. It goes down to the kernel. The kernel says, oh, this is the system call you want. It says open CD-ROM drive. So it goes to the device table, finds out where the CD-ROM drive is down here, and sends a, sends a message down here via the driver interface. So the driver is controlling the lower level instruction that's coming down to the hardware. Hardware is going to open up and perform. It's going to do everything it can do, essentially. It's going to open, close. It's going to do whatever instruction it was given. It's going to send an interrupt back up to the kernel mode and say, hey, I'm done. I did it. And then the kernel is going to go all the way back up to the user and say, okay, we're done. Return zero. We're done. And then the activity gets performed, which is how the user mode uses the software on the computer to communicate with the kernel to communicate with the hardware. And with the operating system's job, and versus this is the operating system right here, well, the operating system's job is to provide this, this interface. And it's, it's a layered interface. So if you can remember that, and all operating systems work the same way. It's, um, we have different variations of this. Um, with what's inside the kernel or what's inside the user mode. As an example, user mode is generally the desktop, which is going to be your Windows system, your command line prompt, your touch interface, uh, whatever, it depends on the operating system. The kernel might be one file, it might be a ton of files. So we have uni unified kernels, we have uh, small self-contained kernels, or we have kernels that say, well, let's just load everything afterwards. And the design of the kernel is going to give us your flexibility in your operating system. As an example, if you want to be able to change hardware drivers, you want to be able to, you know, oh, we have this new SCSI drive, we have this new USB port or something, it's easier to add something to the operating system environment via an external um, driver than it is to actually, like, you know, recompile the kernel every time you upgrade your system create a new kernel and have everything inside of the kernel. So now the modern kind of modern, modern kind of trend is called what's called a micro kernel. It's a small itsy bitsy little kernel that doesn't really have anything in it. It's just the brains. And then everything else gets loaded on which, which was what's called a kernel loadable module. So we have a kernel kernel loadable loadable module that gets loaded into a micro kernel. Which is small, and it's and it allows flexibility as well because you can run essentially this operating system on any any hardware and include any driver for any software that you might need. So, when you install Windows as an example, it I don't know about Windows Seven, but let's talk about XP because I'm familiar with that a little bit. Part of the install goes through and checks your hardware right in the beginning and says, "What do we have?" Oh, we have a hard drive, we have this, we have that, and then it only loads kernel loadable modules and the things it needs to support the hardware that's in your system. And it loads the specific drives, drivers for the hardware. So it's small, it creates kind of a smaller fo footprint. In the old days, it was the opposite. It had everything. You, lo you installed the operating system and it had everything possible, which is a lot of stuff. It runs slower. So I mean, the one thing to make it run faster is don't load stuff you don't need to load. And only load stuff that's specific for the hardware, essentially, and make it so that the drivers you're getting are the right drivers. So that separation is really nice, actually. And in Windows, we we see it with not only the drivers, but we see it with the application programs, because in Windows we have what's called a dynamically linked library, where we can even in the application programming interfaces, we can have DLL files stored all over the system, and these DLL files are accessed by the running program in the runtime environment. And it's separated. It's not compiled in with the program source code. So what ends up happening is you can change the DLL file. You can update it and um, get another one from a different vendor. And then what ends up happening is you've got more flexibility in the long run. So same concept applies to the kernel and the way that the kernel is loading modules. So I think I'll leave that there for right now and go back to back to the lecture, pick up where I left off. But uh, usually if there's a board, I like to write it on the board. Uh, but I didn't see a board. I don't see a pen. So, uh, so let's see.
go back to uh, where I left off, which was um, right here. Yep. Interrupts. I was talking about interrupts. Common functions of interrupts. So I talked about interrupts a few minutes ago, and I showed you that little diagram. Interrupts are coming from the hardware. They're coming back up. The uh, kernel has to catch them. Because what ends up happening is kind of like a keyboard, as an example. You press a bunch of stuff on the keyboard. Um, if you had to wait for the kernel to catch each one of those keys, you'd be typing pretty slow. <laughs> so what it does is it has, like, it has a, a way of catching it and storing it and processing it in a queue until the queue fills up. In fact, actually, you can do that yourself. You can just type really fast on the keyboard in some DOS programs, and you'll fill up the queue, and it won't be able to handle it. Instead, it'll start beeping at you. Kind of funny. Or when your computer is booting, you can do the same thing because the queue is really small, essentially. Uh, but all different types of interrupts that come, not only just from the keyboard, but from other areas, end up coming in and they end up getting stored. So the interrupt transfers the control to the interrupt service routine, generally through what's called an interrupt vector, which contains the address of all the service routines. So the service routines are related to the hardware and related to driver support for services that are being provided and things that are supposed to happen when an interrupt occurs. So interrupt architecture um, must save the address of the interrupt instruction and coming interrupts are disabled while another interrupt is being processed. So you don't uh, prevent the loss interrupt, essentially only one at a time. And then this concept of a trap. And a trap is a software generated interrupt that is caused either by an error or by a user request. And the kernel can actually create a trap. It creates traps when it creates uh, things that, such as, a, like for example, a page fault. Um, or a trap when it has to send something, feedback, up to the user. Say, hey, we're out of memory. We're running low on memory. Um, which is a way of the kernel basically doing a software interrupt and acting like an interrupt person, like just like a hardware person would. And send it back up to the user to say, hey, you know what? resources are running low or the hard drive has stopped working or something has happened or uh, we tried to load a piece of memory and it's not in memory so we had to go stop stop go load it come back so the operating system uh, is what's referred to as normally an interrupt driven environment so so we have interrupt handlers and the operating system preserves the state of the CPU by storing registers in the program counter Determine which type of interrupt has occurred. Is it a pooling one or is it a vector interrupt uh, system? And uh, separate segments of code uh, are determined for which actions are going to be taken, and each type of interrupt is actually received. And uh, interrupts are something where I'm not going to spend an entire chapter on interrupts. Rather than that, what you're going to see is interrupts as a concept coming into a lot of different other chapters and a lot of different other conversations because if it's an, when we're talking about an interrupt driven type of system, we have different types of interrupts for different reasons, and they're processed differently. And uh, it usually ends up being a common thing among a lot of the different topics in terms of the subsystems. Here's an interrupt timeline showing you the CPU, the user processes that are executing, the I.O. interrupt process, I.O. devices, whether they are, are they idle, are they transferring data, and then all of the different kind of ons and offs that are associated. The I.O. request, transfer is done. Another I/O request transfer is done, and kind of the um, sort of the you know the idea of an interrupt is received, process it, another one process it, another one process it. So it's kind of like how the traffic guard, the CPU, excuse me, the kernel takes instructions and processes the instructions essentially, and it's sometimes referred to as requests. So interrupt requests that come in, and it's basically the hardware speaking essentially. We also have an I.O. structure that is associated with this architecture. Everyone's heard of I.O. It's the, you know, the monitor, the USB ports, the CD-ROM drive. So I, and after I.O. starts, the uh, control returns to the user program upon which the I.O. Uh, was supposed to be completed, upon the I.O. completion. And then it waits for an instruction and becomes idle. So I.O. just kind of sits there, and it waits for requests. And if it's not being used, it just sits there idle. And then when it has a request, it processes the request and returns control back to the user. There is um, what's referred to as, uh, and this is kind of going back to that little thing I just drew up a few minutes ago, it, it is what establishes what's called a dual mode system 
And the dual mode is that user mode and the kernel mode. And the I.O. requests happen in kernel mode. So some might say that there's a switch of command or control. So you're in user mode, and then you switch to the kernel mode. The I.O. happens, and then it switches back to the user mode. Um, on a Windows system, you can kind of sort of see the switch because sometimes you have that little pause that goes on, especially when you're using devices. As an example, if you threw a CD-ROM, a music CD, let's say, for example, and you threw it in your CD-ROM drive, it kind of sits there, you can hear the drive going, and nothing else is working. That's it's representing the switch. And then all of a sudden, you know, like a little icon, you know, a little program opens up, the default program that was associated with music or something, that's a Windows Media Player or something like that, or iTunes comes up. Then there's usually a little bit of delay. It's not an instant it's not an instant process. Because what ends up happening is you get the user mode switching to the kernel mode for an I.O. request. Everything's happening in the kernel mode. Nothing's happening in the user mode. You're pretty much frozen. But you never really notice that because you're just waiting. Users are pretty patient that way. <laughs> so part of the design of the operating system is to sequence the events so that the wait is minimized and that the user's experience is maximized. So the user's not sitting around there going, waiting for this waiting for that. And can you imagine what would happen if only one window could open up at a time or something like that nature? So so a lot of the design is really for the user's experience. As so you go going back to the I.O. structure, after the I.O. starts, the control returns the user program upon. Only upon I.O. completion does it actually return back to the user's program. There's a wait instruction. Idles the CPU until the next interrupt occurs. And then there's a wait loop, just a continuous contention for memory access. And at least one I.O. request is outstanding at a time, no simultaneous I.O. is processing. So only one I.O. request is actually occurring. It's kind of like how the CPU works, actually. All these different little hardware devices, they only work one at a time in terms of the instructions, but they all can work simultaneously because they all have different separate buses. After the I.O. starts, control returns to the user's program without waiting for the I.O. completion, which is another mode that could possibly, possibly could be in the configuration this is when we have a system call. So here's our word system call. This is kind of the reason why I wanted to mention that prior to getting to this part in the lecture. A system call is a request to the operating system to allow the user to wait for I.O. completion. It's kind of, um, it creates the dual mode. So the system mode, when the user mode says, hey, open the CD-ROM drive, the user mode is expected to wait, essentially. Doesn't mean you can't work on another program. But that running process that started that opening of the CD-ROM drive is waiting for the return. And then we have a device status table inside of the kernel. And this is what's containing the, every entry for the I.O. device, its type, address, state, all of the information that's associated with the I.O. And then we have the operating system indexes uh, that are into the I.O. device tables to determine the device status. So at any one moment of time, the I.O. devices and are going to be reporting their status back to the kernel. Kernel is going to keep track of it. Because the kernel knows if the CD-ROM drive is already open, don't open it. <laughs> yeah. If it's closed, open it. Yeah. Um, if it's closed, don't close it again. Um, which makes a lot of sense for efficiency. You want to keep track of the status of things. And here's our two I.O. modes. One was the synchronous and one was the asynchronous. The asynchronous one says stop, wait. That's the one that uses the system call interface. The synchronous one doesn't wait. Um, so here we have the user mode and the kernel mode. So kind of the same picture I drew you before, but I didn't put lines across here. Um, this the slide didn't put lines across. A is this uh, A and B. So, the, so the, in the synchronous type of mode, the user makes a request. It goes down. It's going to go through the same layers of abstraction. But what we're going to have is, um, you know, the request goes to the device driver. The device driver and the interrupt handler work together, sort of goes down and we transfer control and we send the data to the hardware. The hardware sends a signal back up. This is we're done. And it, whether it works, you know, synchronously, you know, live, like real in real time kind of fashion, or whether it works, you know, okay, we sent the request, then we go back to work and eventually the drive opens up. So we don't actually get that. Instead we have to wait. <laughs> so Windows is very much a synchronous type of environment in terms of IO requests. And here's a little picture of what this device table sort of looks like. And here's the interesting thing. When you start building an operating system, 
you have to start thinking, well, what are all these components that are going to be in this operating system? And an operating system is just nothing more than a C program or a Java program. It's an application that's written in a programming language, usually multiple programming languages, because there's usually some assembly language or something in there for the device control. But long story short, we're thinking about data structures that are going to be used to create a table to keep track of, let's say, devices, or a table to keep track of I.O. requests, or CPU scheduling, or runtime environment information. So we have stacks and queues and hash tables and all sorts of different structures that are used, which is why a lot of people take a data structures course, actually, so they can kind of figure out, well, you know, it's part of programming, essentially. Uh, but here's an example of the device type, the device status table. And here we have a, it's for a card reader. So the device is card reader number one. We have another device, which is going to be a, a line printer, a disk, you know, all sorts of different devices. Each one of the devices would have its own entry in the device status table. And then it keeps track of all the requests for all of the different instructions. Now every one of the requests from the system call interface should be associated with a driver instruction. So what ends up happening when we have incompatibilities is we have a piece of hardware that doesn't listen to the driver <laughs> because the driver doesn't have the right instructions for that hardware. It was made for another piece of hardware. Or there is a utility or usefulness that the user wants to do to the device that for which it has no interface. And when that occurs, there's a d d driver that doesn't have a call to open or a call to close or something. So what ends up happening in a lot of ways is some of the little patches you get for Windows and the upgrades and stuff like that. A lot of it is the fixed driver control. It's to maximize, you know, minimize, minimize wait time, maximize the speed of the driver, um, and how, you know, add, add some new features to it or something. So now we have direct memory access structures used for uh, high-speed I.O. devices that are able to transmit information as close to the memory speed uh, so we don't have to wait for the memory. So if we create an environment that uses uh, direct memory access structures, device drivers, c device controllers transfer blocks of data from buffer storage directly to main memory without CPU intervention. Because the CPU, believe it or not, slows things down. <laughs> because the CPU is also working with everything else on the system. Um, so if we can have direct memory access to the devices themselves, which is why a lot of devices actually have their own memory, so they can create their own buffer space and they can create their own memory and use their memory more efficiently. And a good example of that might be, as an example, graphics cards. Actually, you can't really buy a graphics card these days. It doesn't have like at least 512 or a gig of memory on it. it needs it. And it's actually, now the modern day cards they even have graphics processors. They have GPUs on them. Because we need a GPU close to the processing. And we almost have like a computer inside of a computer these days with those graphic cards. Not all of them, but some of them. If you're doing heavy game programming, if you've got a system that's doing, you know, a monitor, uh, it's uh, running DVDs constantly, um, stream streaming music or audio or something of that nature. Um, well, anything of a graphic nature, I should say. Um, CAD programs and stuff. You're going to have a huge, uh, hopefully you're going to have a lot of memory. Um, and you're going to have a pretty substantial GPU probably going on. Um, so only one interrupt is generated per block rather than uh, one interrupt per byte in that, in that configuration. And now we have storage structures. As I mentioned before, we have main memory. We also have what's called secondary memory. So here's our main memory by definition. It's the only large storage media that the CPU can access directly, which is actually kind of true because the CPU doesn't actually access the cache. Eh, it can. Uh, but in most configurations, it works with the main memory directly. A secondary storage is the extension of the main memory that provides large non-volatile storage capacity. Main memory is when you turn the computer off, everything goes away. Secondary storage, you save your files there, and we come back, you turn your computer on, and your files are still there, hopefully. And uh, it's sometimes called secondary, sometimes it's called external memory, because by tradition, it's not normally on the board. Um, so they go call it external. Magnetic disks, we don't see those anymore. I don't even use floppy disks anymore. Now we have flash drives. So. Uh, the disk surface is logically on a magnetic disk into tracks, sectors, kind of disk controller. 
And now we have this thing called storage hierarchy. <clears throat> so storage hierarchy is organized by speed, cost, and is it going to go away? Totality. Caching is uh, another way of uh, speeding up main memory. Copying information into faster storage systems. Main memory can be viewed as a last cache for secondary storage. Um, as an interesting concept, um, the operating system, when you're talking about main memory, doesn't really use it. We have physical memory that's installed on a computer. This operating system, one of the main jobs of the operating system is to come up with its memory management system. And the memory management system, and we'll have an entire chapter on this, takes and creates a logical representation of the physical memory and does things like paging, and creates frames, and uses an abstraction of the physical memory to create what it needs in terms of the data structure and the storage itself for running programs, keeping track of processes, and stuff like that. So it's kind of interesting because if you think of the concept, if you've got memory, and, and most people have seen them like little chip cards, you know, you got one gig, two gig cards, three gigs, they're all different. They're all come from different manufacturers, they all have different memory addresses and stuff. And usually they go into what's, uh, they all get wired essentially into what's called a memory management unit, an MMU. And the operating system normally reads the information from the MMU, but that's not, that's not even going to be good enough. And in fact, all of the memory we put on that computer, believe it or not, those 2 gigs, 4 gigs, 6 gigs, 8 gigs or whatever, still not enough memory. <laughs> so what the operating system does is it takes that and turns it into 30 gigs, turns it into 20 gigs or whatever it needs to do to make a more efficient use of it. So that'll be a pretty interesting chapter when we talk about main memory. Here's our storage hierarchy. As I remembered before, I talked about, I mentioned the concept of registers, maybe, maybe not. Imagine the CPU right here. And we've got underneath the CPU, we've got registers. Registers are what's really um, being used by the runtime environment, storing instructions. So an instruction comes out of a a program, a process that's started, and I'll go through this when I talk about processes as well. Information gets stored in uh, registers in terms of, and uh, gets, you know, facilitated with the use of a stack and some heap memory that's uh, being created to process instructions. And then it hits the cache normally, um, and then it goes main memory, and then electronic disk, magnetic disk, optical disk, and magnetic tapes, or these would be a uh, floppy drives or let's say USB drives modern day. The hierarchy is kind of interesting because this is the most expensive, this is the cheapest, this is the fastest, this is the slowest. <laughs> so the hierarchy kind of goes to very expensive, very fast, to extremely cheap and very slow. Which is kind of interesting because people like try to take cheap memory and use it to put an operating system on it you know, running it from the operating system through, let's say, a USB port, always going to be slower. If you're running stuff through a slower channel, through a USB interface, through an external secondary storage interface, farther away from the CPU that's actually running the instructions, everything is always going to run slower. So, In a perfect world, we would have huge cache, huge number of registers, and you know, reasonable size main memory, and who cares about everything else? But that computer would be like four thousand dollars these days. <laughs> so in order to sell a computer for three hundred dollars, you have just enough registers to get by. Maybe not. No cash at all. Get rid of the cash. You don't need it. Main memory that the user puts on himself. You know, everybody has. To, well, it comes with five twelve maybe or a gig. And then uh, everything else the user can configure himself or herself. So. When you can no, normally tell more expensive computers when they have bigger caches on them. And the caches is actually what's going to make the computer run faster. Which is kind of interesting. Because systems with a lot of cache, with one gig of memory, run faster than systems with no cache and 100 gigs of memory. <laughs> Name memory. So it's not a matter of buying memory and sticking it on the computer. It doesn't make it run faster. If you don't have any cash, and if the configuration is not set correctly, and you have a good balance. So when you go buy an extra computer, look at the specs. <laughs> and actually, the specs of the processor, how fast the processor is running, that doesn't matter either. Because 
The processor can only run as fast as the number of registers, going back to here, and it, it can, and it's, it's working with registers. If it fills up the registers, it's done. It can only work with the fast, how much capacity it has to actually process the information. So you can have, and then, and then you, know, you can have a lot of registers overclock the CPU and make it run faster. You can have very little registers, and, you know, extremely fast CPU, and you can have a slow system. <laughs> Especially if you don't have, you know, barely enough registers, bar no cache, you're going to have an extremely slow system with one of the best CPUs on the market. So the trick is finding the right configuration. This is what your computer manufacturers are doing. They're playing around with this. So some of them stack on a slow CPU, bad chip, with a lot of reg a lot of cache memory. Yeah. And in fact, your, your compacts will do that. Um, in the old days, they had huge cache systems. Extremely slow process. Wait, it ran as fast as a faster process system, though. So, And the chips are expensive. Processor chips are expensive. This stuff is not quite as, because the chip's right here on the hierarchy. <laughs> so we're getting cheaper and cheaper the more we go out <laughs> away from the CPU. Caching. Important principle, performing at many different levels in the computer. <sighs> Hardware operating systems. For, actually, it has a couple of different jobs to it. Information is used or is copied from slower to faster storage temporarily. Um, so it's faster to go from here to here than it is from here to here, yeah, if you think about the distance uh, in terms of uh, how close it is to the CPU. So caching is always going to be kind of a temporary uh, storage area buffer for <laughs> information from the registers. Um, and so it's not quite as far. It doesn't take as long to load. The thing with main memory, even as the operating system creates its own abstraction of main memory, it's not really it's tied to physical, but it's not an exact one-to-one -one match. This fills up with the limitations of the physical memory, and then this ends up going this way in terms of a backing store, in terms of a swap drive, in terms of other mechanisms that can be implemented from a software perspective to make the main memory bigger, essentially. So in a swap drives, stuff like that, or uses a secondary storage, uses a hard drive. Uh, so let's see, uh, faster storage is the cache. Checks first to determine if the information is there. So let's say you had something loaded and you filled up everything and you know you weren't quite done with a, something that needed to be stored in memory. So you put it on the cache. If it's not in the cache, then it's going to go to main memory. If it's not in the main memory, it's going to go to a swap drive or a packing store, which is going to be a secondary storage area for it. And essentially, the hierarchy starts at the cache and moves forward. So if you have a huge cache system and you're not using it, your search space is bigger and actually can slow your computer down. So it depends on the configuration. And there's so much cache that makes it possible. There's a, there's a point in which there's like a break-even point in speed in which you can add on a certain amount. Because, you know, in theory, people look at this and go, oh, we'll just make this really big. The only problem is, the more memory you actually have, the longer it takes to search it, <laughs> the longer it takes to use it. So it's faster sometimes to have half, which is what people do with um, swap drives, actually. They won't ever install like a Linux build on a computer. You install Linux, let's say. First big question you have to answer is like, do you want to use swap space or not? <laughs> and usually they tell you, Make it one half the size of your main memory. And then people go, why do we have to do that? Because if you make it too big, it run, ends up slowing your system down because it's too much room to, it's too much space to have to actually go search through. And if you take an algorithms course, you'll notice the search space, the bigger it is, the slower the efficiency of the algorithm. So smaller groups, smaller spaces, easier to search. Uh, but we'll have an entire lecture on cache memory and main memory as well. This is just your overview of it today. Uh, so, what do we have? Direct access fast. And if not, the data is copied to the cache. If it's not there. Cache uh, smaller than the storage being cached. Then the cache management uh, is important in terms of the design and the size and the replacement policy. So, the replacement policy is referred to as sort of, you know, sort of like page replacement with virtual memory. And I'll get to that concept when we talk about main memory and virtual memory. So the performance of various different levels of storage, movement between the levels of the hierarchy are explicit or implicit. 
So here we have our levels. And a, this is the registers, the cache, the main memory, the disk storage. And this is kind of giving you, you know, I said, okay, closer to the CPU, faster, farther away, slower, expensive, cheap. <laughs> this is giving you the numbers, essentially, to say the same thing. Um, typical size, smaller, bigger, bigger, bigger. So it gets bigger in size. The implementation uh, technology, this is going to be with uh, multiple ports, CMOS related. This is going to be SRAM, DRAM. Yeah, magnetic disks, and uh, actually magnetic disks are kind of going away too. Solid state drives coming out, very popular these days. Um, access time, as you see, it's slower here, faster here. So bandwidth, smaller bandwidth, faster bandwidth in terms of the channel, the bus speed. Actually, because it's closer, it has less. To, 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 it actually has higher bandwidth as, as well as uh, latency. Uh, compiler. Managed by the compiler, managed by uh, hardware, operating system, operating system. So. so the migration of an integer A from the disk to the registers. This is kind of an interesting following. And going back to this concept here, if you're going from down here to up here, yeah, it's going to take longer <laughs> than if it's right here. So this is where the orchestration and the management comes into place. So multitasking environments must be careful so that they use the most uh, recent value of something. So a new matter when it's being stored in the hierarchy moves from a magnetic disk to the main memory to the cache to the hardware registers. It can't go from here to here. It's got to go through the layers in order to actually get there, uh, which makes it slower in terms of uh, the different steps. So multiprocessing environments, they must provide cache for coherency in uh, hardware such as CPU. Uh, so most recent value is used. Distributed systems are a little bit more complex, and that's really a topic for, uh, actually it's in Chapter 17, but uh, one of the things we'll talk about later in the course, much later, is the uh, concept of um, different types of distributed systems versus single-mode systems or single-user type systems and how some of them can be more efficient or better used for different purposes. Multi-programming. It's needed for efficiency. Remember the DOS days? Actually, you guys ever you guys, you guys use DOS? You know what DOS is? I did this to an undergraduate class and I went, DOS? What are you talking about? Disk operating system? You guys know DOS prompts, right? Command prompts on your computer? You're all Windows users, I'm going to assume. Well, but we never used to have Windows. We had DOS. And then we had Windows. Oh, we had Windows 3.0. You, you typed in Windows, or W-I-N, and it loaded up a program, and you ran a program that allowed you to actually have multiple programs running simultaneously. Before we had that, we had DOS, you know, your command line prompt, and uh, we had different programs that we could run, and they were TSRs, Terminate Stay Resonant, and they were hot switched. So you press like the function keys or a combination of keys, and it's switched between one program and another. And uh, Windows actually kind of changed the concept, made it easier. Because if, if, if you haven't noticed in Windows, you're really only running one thing at a time. Because even if you do run things simultaneously, you're still just running one thing at a time. <sighs> the processor can only process one instruction at a time. So take all the stuff you're doing, Put it in a big old list and give it to the processor, which is what you're doing, and let the processor decide what it wants to run first, which is what you're doing. Then you've got multi-programming systems. We still, on a single process system, one, sing one single CPU can only process one instruction at a time, which is kind of interesting because we don't really think of it that way because these systems today and in the interfaces that we have gives us the illusion that we have we have Word, we have PowerPoint. And right now I have uh, I have that other text editor I was working on. I got the PowerPoint slide up. I got recording software going on. But my computer, my CPU is only processing one instruction at a time. It's a, still a single, single instruction, synchronous processing, one right after the other. So which is kind of interesting. So single users cannot keep CPU and I/O devices busy all the time. They have to be shared. Multiprogramming organizes jobs or code and data, so CPU always has one to execute 
So it takes everything, puts it in a big list, and goes through the list. Subset of total jobs in the system is kept in memory. One job selected and run via what's called job scheduling. That's why we have a CPU scheduler. We actually have to say which processes have which instructions that need to run now, which ones should be run, which ones should go to different devices like uh, I.O. queues and things of that nature. And uh, how are we going to schedule these jobs? So when it has to wait for I.O., for example, the operating system switches to another job. Just, you know, basically goes through another, uh, another, another batch of instructions that it might be holding on to. So time sharing or multitasking is a logical extension in which the CPU switches jobs so frequently that the users can interact with each job while it is running, creating an interactive computing environment. So the time sharing or the multitasking is the Windows environment that you're getting, where you've got multiple windows open up, and you've got multiple processes running, and the CPU is normally working hard, hopefully, because you want to work it to death. I mean, you want to work it, because otherwise you're not going to get as much processing that's going on. So response time should be hopefully less than a second, one second. Each user has at least one program executing in memory, which is the program executing in memory is the terminology called a process. That's actually chapter three, and then chapter four are threads. If several jobs are ready to run at the same time, we have CPU scheduling, which is what I keep talking about. Um, we have an entire chapter on CPU scheduling coming up. If the processes don't fit in memory, we have a swapping routine that moves moves them out, puts them into a backing store or into a swap drive, makes room for more memory, and virtual memory, which allows execution of the process not co completely in the main memory. So, And now uh, one final comment about that CPU I was talking about. So we have CPUs, you know, that are single CPU systems, and then, uh, you know, a couple, I don't know, a couple years ago, I guess, by now, they came out with these dual mode, dual CPUs, right? Which were two CPUs that were strung together, that were both working together. Not as good as two separate solo, two solo CPUs. Which was kind of interesting, because if you had one, imagine the concept of the CPU, and it being the most expensive piece on the entire system. You know, the whole motherboard is cheaper than the CPU most expensive item you're purchasing and they got a whole big old batch of old ones that are slower <laughs> so you take two slow ones you put them together it equals a fast one right which is the concept in the in the beginning and then we ended up with oh now we actually do have we actually do have two CPUs now running simultaneously and then people wonder wow why do we need it on a cell phone imagine what happens with a cell phone those d d droid phones they actually do have two independent, simultaneously running CPUs. One of the newer ones that are coming out have come out this year. You need it because you have a lot of stuff going on. You have a lot of multitasking and time sharing going on because not only is this a phone device that has to send and receive text messages, incoming calls, outcomes, but you're running applications. So you're using it like a computer. You've got web browsers up there. you got all this other stuff going on. And then you got all the utility of the telephone. So that was like one of the brightest things I think they ever came out with. Make it dual. <laughs> Put two processors on it. Makes it easier. There's a lot of people wondering, why do we have any two processors on this sucker? Because that, the processor speed is what's controlling your level of multi-programming and multitasking. You can't multitask on a, on a single process system and do it quickly. So it's the, way, the, the easiest way without rewriting the operating system, the easiest way to do it is to put in multiple CPUs. But here's the interesting thing, it's kind of, this is kind of the catch to everything, is, well, does the operating system support multiple CPUs? <laughs> so, if it's small and multiple CPUs and they're all tied together so they're actually running as one and it's giving you higher speeds, more processing power, and the operating system doesn't know that there's two, the operating system thinks there's just one and it's being used together. If we actually have two independent CPUs on the system, we can actually really theoretically put two separate operating systems on that second and keep track of both of them separately, which is what a lot of the different hardware configurations are doing these days, especially with embedded systems. One of them is being used solely for these particular tasks, 
and then the other one is being used for the user interface or other tasks or something. Uh, so it used to be a load balance essentially, load balance between the, the processors, which um, is pretty much what's going on with those uh, mobile mobile devices that are using dual CPUs these days. So. Um, but it'd be interesting to see what they do in the future. I mean, I can imagine a system with five CPUs on it. <laughs> but CPUs are expensive, so it's not going to happen anytime soon. So, uh, so what do we got here? The layer, the memory layout of a multi-programming system, where we have the operating system, and then we have job number one, job number two, job number three, or four. What are these things? These are programs that you're running. So you you turned on your computer, loaded up a Windows operating system. You double clicked on Microsoft Word, you double clicked on PowerPoint, you double clicked on Notepad. Every one of these turns into a job. It gets loaded up into memory. CPU takes one instruction at a time from each one of the jobs and processes all of them like that, hopefully. <laughs> operating system operations. Well, we all we know already. I talked about the concept of that interrupt driven. So it's interrupt driven by the hardware. Hardware sits there and doesn't do anything until it has a problem. And then it sends an interrupt up to the kernel. Software errors or requests are created by exceptions or traps by the kernel. The kernel actually uses a, you know, creates a trap. This is a software interrupt that it creates. It sends it up, sends it down. Some examples of that might be a divide by zero or request for an operating service. You know, um, Other process problems include uh, infinite loops as an example. Processes modifying each other. Um, getting rid of, or excuse me, um, you know, writing in somebody else's, some other process's memory space of something of that nature. And then uh, by terminology, I mentioned this already, so this is sort of a summary of it, the dual mode operations I talked about before, which allows the operating system to protect itself. So one of the reasons why this dual mode came out as an overall design was you've got a user who is able to do anything they want to the operating system. So if you make a dual mode kind of format out of it, split it out so you got the user mode and the kernel mode, you make it so that the user can't touch anything in the kernel mode. And the kernel mode is self-contained, it's protected. So a lot of it is done for protection mechanisms. And then the system call interface being used by the user mode to get through the protection to run a service so that the kernel can actually do something. We have mode bits that are provided by the hardware and provides the ability to essentially distinguish when uh, the system is running user mode or kernel mode. It's usually switched by a mode bit. And some instructions that are designated as privileged are kernel related, only executed by the kernel. We use our uh, system calls that change the mode. So here we have our system calls that change the mode to kernel. Return from call requests. Uh, it goes back to the user that requested it. And here's another picture of that thing I tried to draw on Notepad, or Text Wrangler, I think I was using. And this one has the line down the center, which is good. Somebody, uh, one of my students a long time ago said, this looks like Texas toast. Um, actually, the other thing I draw looks like Texas toast, because it's like a piece of cheese in the middle, and it has a piece of bread on the top and a piece of bread on the bottom. I didn't know what Texas toast was, but I still don't know what it was. But Man, like maybe a grilled cheese sandwich. I don't know. <laughs> what do you get? This line in the center, if you draw it big enough, it looks like a piece of cheese sometimes, I guess. I don't know. Uh, but we got the user process and we got the kernel. I like to call them modes. This di if I were to rewrite this diagram, oh, here it is user mode, kernel mode. Mode bit one, mode bit zero, and the bit changes. Oh, we're in kernel mode, we're in user mode. You can think of it that way if you want. So the user process is executing, it performs a system call, the system call creates a trap changes the mode bit to zero, goes down here, executes a system call, which does something in the hardware you can't see on the slide, it's underneath it. The hardware finishes, it sends something back up to the calling process and says, oh, I'm done, returns the mode bit to one, sends it back up, and we have this return from the system call. So in a lot of the APIs, this is where we get the call and the return. Call a function, we get a return from a function. So it's kind of the same concept, actually. The timer is uh, to prevent the infinite loop, uh, so we don't have any infinite loops that occur down here. So if this doesn't, if this system call doesn't make any sense, then it's rejected after a certain amount of time. It just doesn't sit there and go like this, you know, trying to run something. 
Uh, sets the interrupt after a specific period of time. Operating system decrements the counter. Then the counter is uh, changed to generate the interrupt. And then it sets it back after the end. So. And now we have the concept of process management uh, to consider. Where we have... Oops, hold on a second. Ah, there we go. Checking my time. <laughs> so a process... Uh, a process is a program. So we have programs on the computer that sit there, you know, the exe files, the desktop icons, all those things you have on your computer. You double click on them and they turn into processes. That's what a process is. Um, we're going to have an entire chapter on processes, process management, the concept of threads. The first assignment for this course is actually working with the concept of processes and I'll talk about that next week. But the process um, is a program in execution. It is a unit of work within the system. And the program is a passive entry process, if it's pro or it's a process is an active entry, meaning is it running or is it not running? So it's passive if it's just sitting there. It's active if it's actually doing something. Processes need resources, usually, to accomplish their tasks. They use, need CPU memory, I.O., files, initialization of data. They need all sorts of different components that they're actually able to use. The kernel services them up. Um, process termination requires a, re a reclaim of the reusable resources, also referred to sometimes as garbage collection, uh, which is kind of interesting. That's why uh, the Java, going back to the concept of the operating system of the JVM, which is an operating system, the Java virtual machine, um, it does its own garbage collection. So it does its own memory management. So if you start looking at the features of the JVM, it looks like an operating system. It doesn't have, you know, its own desktop interface. It doesn't have, you know, some support for some of the other hardware that other operating systems have. But it sure does do a lot of operating system functionality. So that's why most people say, oh, it's an operating system that you load on top of an operating system to run Java programs, essentially. Uh, okay, so the process terminates. A uh, single threaded process has one program counter, and there's some more terminology for you specifying the location of the next instruction to execute. So the program counter uses the registers, loads instructions up, processes the information, use, utilizing the CPU, and then unloads the registers and loads up new instructions. And the pro program counter is the, kind of the bookmark in the processing of that process that keeps track of what's run and what hasn't run. Because we have multiple processes that are all queued up, and only one instruction at a time is running. <laughs> so we have to stop. We have to share. So the CPU scheduler takes and runs a little bit of this process, stops it, runs a little bit of the next one, stops it, a little bit of the next one, stops it. So naturally, the more stuff you have running, the slower your system's going to run. So long story short, after hearing this, run one, one program at a time, and you'll get a faster execution speed normally. <laughs> so. Uh, let's see, processes execute instructions sequentially, one at a time, until they're completed. Multi-threaded processes has one program counter per thread. We'll talk about that when we get to the threading. And typically systems have many different processes, some users, some systems, some operating systems, some kernel level, running concurrently on one or more CPUs, which is interesting, um, which is why you want to have dual CPUs. Uh, concurrently, by multiplexing the CPUs among different processes and threads. So we multitask it. Process management activities that occur. The operating system is responsible for the following activities, and they might be including creating and deleting both user and system processes, suspending and resuming processes, providing a mechanism for process synchronization, communication, deadlock, handling, starvation, all sorts of different issues that might be associated with that. I already talked a little bit about memory management already as an overview. I believe this is going to be like chapter 5 of the book. So it's going to be about five weeks down the road here. Uh, but all the data is um, in memory before it actually gets processed. So um, the data in memory before and after processing, all of the instructions in the memory in the order that they're going to be executed. And this would be features of the management system. Every operating system has a memory management system. You're supposed to optimize the CPU utilization, hopefully, and the memory management activities that are performed, which, in a nutshell, keeping track of which program is using which piece of memory <laughs> and what's garbage and what's being currently accessed. 
because it needs to replace. You only have so much of a resource. When it's done being used, you got to re put it back into the open pool and let it be used for something else. Storage management. The operating system, believe it or not, does handle your storage. Uh, the Windows operating system has FAT32, FAT16, NTFS, uh, NTFS um, all sorts of different types of formats for file systems. The operating system is what's reading the file system, translating it, using it, allowing you to save files and stuff like that. Performs uh, uniform logical operations, abstract physical properties, concept of the file is an operating system abstraction. Different operating systems have different formats for different files, you may have noticed. Um, some operating systems support multiple file formats. As an example, the OS X, you can read Windows. I think you can actually now read, can you read HSF plus Mac files on a Windows machine? I don't think you can, actually. I think it's just the other way around. I think the Mac system is supporting Windows, but the Windows system, I don't believe, is supporting a FS, a FHS plus or whatever it is. The, Mac formatted file system, HFS plus, that's what it is. <laughs> so, um, but don't quote me on that. I bet you could probably load it on as a separate driver, separate operating, separate like program to actually interpret those files. Uh, file system management. The organization of the directories, the FAT tables, all that different information is organized and is managed by the operating system. Creating, deleting files, manipulating files, directories, and stuff. Mass storage management is also part of the operating system, the ability to go find something on a disk, bring it up into memory. Usually disks are used to store data, so it won't fit in long-term memory. In fact, the, the storage management is also used for what I've been referring to as swap drives. Um, also, backing store concepts are used as secondary storage, and um, we'll definitely have some time spent on that concept. The I.O. systems are also supported by the operating system. In fact, when I think of I.O. systems and I think of Windows, I always think of plug and pray or plug in. What's it? I, don't, I don't even remember what's plug in something. Now I, I've been calling it plug and pray for so long. I don't know what it. I don't know what it's really called anymore. Plug in something. Plug in. It's not plug and pray. Plug in. I don't know. Nobody knows either. Wow. You know. You ever heard the terminology before? When you plug a disc in, you plug, you hook something up, and you get a little, what would you like to do with this? So, I don't know, I was joking around for too I've been joking around with this concept for too many years, and I'm so used to the concept of it being called plug and pray. You, know, you plug it in, you pray, it's recognized. I, 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 don't, I don't even remember what it's called anymore. But anyway, that's the concept <laughs> of IO systems. That's how Windows manages, so uh, well, Actually, everybody does it the same way. So no, no, nothing. That the Windows is doing wrong. It's just that they came up with the concept of plug in something, and that ended up being a term that uh, ended up getting abused, like, you know, slang. Uh, so one purpose of the operating system is to hide the particularities of the hard drives, which is that plug. Plug it in and use it like your camera, your cell phone, and it recognizes the devices that it you know, loads them up and makes them available for the user. And the operating system is providing you with that service. So the I.O. subsystem is responsible for the memory management of the I.O., the buffering, its storage data. The general device driver interface, the devices for the specific hardware uh, itself that's being run. So the operating system is also supposed to be in control of the protection and the security. And I'm waiting for Windows to incorporate antivirus inside of the operating system. You know, a firewall. Well, I actually did firewalls a long, long time ago. But modern day operating systems still don't give you virus protection yet, so, which is kind of interesting because you think that it would be the job of the operating system, right? But users are still installing antivirus programs. So it's usually not the role of the operating system, apparently, at the present stage. But other types of user uh, protection and security are, such as user accounts, multiple logins, different security levels, different levels of abstraction. So when we talk about protection, it's any mechanism for controlling the access of the processes that the users of the resources are defined by the operating system. Security, you know, against attacks, worms, viruses, and things. I personally think some operating systems could provide a little bit more security, a little bit more protection.
Uh, we'll have an entire chapter on that as well. The Linux operating system is where we get the user IDs, the group IDs, the, chain, the modes, the file protection of uh, directories and files of that nature. So privileges and stuff. Some operating systems do a better job supporting um, protection and security than others. Uh, computing environments, the traditional computer blurring over time. Actually, it is kind of. Some actually are speculating that the personal computer is going to go away soon. We're just going to have tablets. I don't know if a tablet can replace a personal computer. I don't know. They don't seem to be used the same way, but we'll see what happens in the future. You know, actually, they were saying for a very, very long time that notebook computers were going to replace desktops. So I think they have sort of. <laughs> you see, when you go into like Fry's, you see one little small line of desktop computers. And everything else is notebooks. <laughs> so perhaps in the future there won't be a concept of a notebook. I don't know. I mean, excuse me, of a desktop. PCs connected to networks, <coughs> terminals, mainframes, many computers, different types of networks, computing environments. <coughs> and the last part of the course, I'll get into the concept of distributed computing environments and those operating systems, comparing them to the distributed and the client server type of models. Um, Sometimes I don't get to this part in the course because it kind of overlaps with client server and computing and other classes that are being taught here. Uh, but if I have time, I'll cover some distributed concepts towards the end. I never really cover peer to peer computing because peer to peer actually is making a comeback, but it essentially went away for a long time. You ever remember Microsoft peer to peer networking? Where you can connect your computer, your computer to another computer like next to you? All you do is write, just share folders, you know. It actually comes in handy, so you don't have to copy stuff on a disk and give it to the other person. And the Mac actually supports it as well, uh, but you have to, it's the same actual kind of feature. You click on the computer and you go, hey, can I access your computer? And you're just sw swapping files, sharing printers and stuff like that. But it's actually making a comeback with cell phones, and a cell phone being used as a hotspot. See, in fact, you can do it with an iPhone, you can do it with most of the Google phones, where you install a little app on there and you turn it on. You can connect your computer to your cell phone and use the cell phone Wi-Fi access, 3G service. A little slower than broadband, but, you know, comes in handy if you don't have broadband or you don't have any other service available to you. You can tether your phone to your computer. That's peer-to-peer, -peer, making a little bit of a comeback. Web-based computing, that is very strong, still very strong. And the web has become ambiguous. Well, it has, actually. We don't know if we're on the web, not on the web. We have so many applications running on our computer that are partly installed on the Internet, and that you don't only notice it when you lose your Internet connection. <laughs> and you go, oh, my program doesn't work. Hmm, okay. Because half of it's on the Internet. Or, you know, you have programs that update themselves. Actually, I find that kind of irritating. And I get those, you know, a new update's available. Why are you wasting my bandwidth downloading updates for me when I could have done that myself later? <laughs> And I'm in a hurry right now or something. Anyway, load balances, load balances are web traffic and stuff. So that was everything you ever wanted to know about this class, actually. Uh, that's chapter one is pretty much an overview of the entire book and all the different concepts. And uh, next week what I'm gonna do is pick one of the first concepts, what I, ch I believe is gonna be uh, the kernel, perhaps. It may also be processes. You know, so I'm gonna go through processes, threads, into memory, into CPU scheduling, a little bit about file systems, a little bit about I.O., a little bit about uh, system calls and stuff like that. So, Questions, comments, or concerns? Nope, then we are done for today. We've accomplished what we needed. So. Hopefully I will see you and more people next week. <laughs> and nothing's due yet. And we haven't, actually none of the materials are even loaded yet, so don't have to worry about that.